for people unfamiliar with you, uh, please tell us your name and what your background is and what you've been doing for the last several years. Sure. Um, I'm David Wallinga. I'm a physician with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I've been working at the intersection of the environment, food, agriculture, and health for 20 plus years, primarily as an advocate, uh, scientist, public health doctor. How did you get involved with the subject of antibiotic resistant bacteria? In the year 2000, uh, so almost 20 years ago, a bunch of nonprofit groups got together and we had a meeting where we talked about the problem of antibiotic resistance and antibiotics being overused in livestock in particular and how we thought that this was a huge issue that was virtually um, overlooked um, by, by both the public and by environmental groups at large and so we created a coalition to address that and uh, amazingly that same group of groups is still working together today with some changes here and there but it, it's really unusual that there has been a, a campaign running for that length of time on one issue. If people have been eating chicken for a long time and many people are in their 80s and 90s, doesn't that mean that chicken is okay to eat? Uh, I, I, I personally am, am an omnivore, to use Michael Pollan's words. Um, I, I eat just about everything. What I'm much more interested in is how the food that I've eaten has been produced and what go, what's gone into it, because ultimately I think that's at least as important as sort of the nutritional category, whether it's a meat or a vegetable. Um, so my work, but also you know, sort of my inclination as a consumer is to think about those bigger environmental issues. What is different about a a chicken in 1919 versus the year 2019? Yeah, so 100 years ago, um, chickens were scroungers. You know, they were out in somebody's backyard picking seeds up off the ground, you know, finding worms or little insects. And uh, that meant their diet was very varied. It also meant that they got plenty of exercise um, and they lasted a lot longer than today's chickens. So chickens today have been through an enormous amount of breeding. Um, they've been bred primarily for one thing, which is putting on a lot of weight quickly. Um, they eat a very different diet. Um, it's fed to them. They don't go get it. And it's mostly f the kinds of things that we grow way too much of in this country, um, corn, um, grains, um, things that are designed to put calories on them quickly. So their diet's very different, and then they're also raised indoors in these enormous sheds where they're crowded together and not really exercising at all, um, getting much sunlight. So I think both those things probably have had an impact on the nutritional quality of the chicken in some way, but also things like whether or not they're carrying antibiotic resistant organisms. When were antibiotics invented and put into regular use and what was different about health and medicine and disease prevention before and after the introduction of antibiotics? Antibiotics were, I think most people kind of have a sense that's correct about them coming about just before World War II. Um, Fleming, I think, was making his initial discoveries in the mid-1920s. Um, it was an, sort of an accident in the laboratory, and then others were making similar sorts of discoveries that this mold that contaminated his Petri dish uh, was producing something that was preventing bacteria from growing, and uh, the name of the mold is how he came up with the name penicillin. Um, it took a while for, uh, it took a while and it took circumstances 
uh, to create the conditions where penicillin was broadly manufactured, namely World War II. So suddenly you've got millions of people at risk of infection and they knew they had to get production ramped up quite quickly uh, to meet the needs of the service. And, you know, it was basically a, a government war effort and, you know, with huge success, you know, arguably, I don't know that anybody knows the numbers, but it made a huge difference to have something in the field to treat wounded soldiers. Second part of your question, though, um, medicine, I have a little bit of perspective, um, but it's nothing you couldn't read in a book. But my, my great-grandfather was a physician, my grandfather was a physician, um, both of them practiced, you know, in the pre-antibiotic days. Physicians had a very different role then, especially somebody who was a generalist like me. They, they wouldn't have been doing surgery, uh, or, or they might have been doing very general surgeries, but simple surgeries. Um, and a lot of infectious diseases, their role was to, you know, um, diagnose and kind of help the patient out with symptoms, but it was almost up to fate and in their general health to, as to whether they were going to survive that infection. You know, even common infections like pneumonia were killing huge numbers of people. Uh, children were dying with regularity from common infectious diseases. So, the the somebody like me who's you know mid 50s who's grown up with antibiotics the world couldn't be more different than the world of somebody like my grandfather who grew up without them are there antibiotics in fish farms there's been antibiotics in virtually all kinds of farming just to give you an idea of the scope um, there's enormous amounts of antibiotics used in livestock um, cattle production, dairy production, uh, pig farming, chicken farming, turkey farming. There's antibiotics used in fish farming, although probably at much lower levels than those other things. Uh, although the little shrimp that are factory farmed in Asia that you get in your curries or your Thai food probably have tons of antibiotics used. Um, there may be antibiotics used in salmon pens, you know, for farmed salmon. And then things that nobody ever thinks about except for me, like ethanol. We grow corn and then we put it in a fermentation vat and throw in some antibiotics and out comes ethanol that you stick in your gas tank. Uh, and we're subsidizing the production of that and the use of the antibiotics is pretty unregulated, so um, nobody really knows about it or is tracking it. How do you know about it? Well, because I've been doing this for 20 years and you run across stuff and go, gee, nobody knows about that. I better learn something about it. And then you submit a Freedom of Information Act request and ask the USDA, you know, how much antibiotic it, are they using? Uh, what are the levels of resistance? In the, uh, in, in the ethanol, or the, the reason this all comes full circle is that when you make ethanol, there's a lot of leftover stuff. You siphon off the liquid, the ethanol, and what you've got is called dried fermentation grains, and that ends up being something that is sold back to the livestock farms and is a big part of the feed that's given to cows, pigs, so actually, they're not only getting the antibiotics in their feed, but they're also getting feed from ethanol vats that has antibiotics already in it. Aren't antibiotics a good thing that has cured many people from infections? If you have an infection and you need an antibiotic, it's an absolutely good thing. Um, and we should be and we will continue to use them for that. The problem is that we're overusing antibiotics to a huge degree. Some of that overuse, a lot of it, is taking place in clinics and urgent care centers where people come in and they say, gee, I've got this cold and I really think I need an antibiotic. And this happened to me once early in my career, actually. 
the doctor says, well, I don't think you do need it because you have a cold and that's caused by a virus. And then the doctor, uh, then the patient pushes on the doctor and the doctor gives in and writes a prescription for them. What happened to me was the clinic doctor said, uh, this patient complained to me because they came and asked for an antibiotic and you wouldn't give it to them. And I said, that's right, they had a virus. He said, the patient's always right, next time give them the antibiotic. <laughs> and that still goes on today. So about half of the antibiotics prescribed in the clinic setting we think are unnecessary. And that's wrong and that's overuse. Um, on farms, on U.S. farms, the figure is probably much higher. Uh, judging by countries that have been able to reduce their total antibiotic use on farms by 65, 70 percent, I expect that uh, it will turn out after the fact that U.S. farms have used about 70 percent more antibiotics than they really needed to. What antibiotics are fed to animals and why? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's really two categories of antibiotics that are fed to animals. Ones that are medically important, in other words, the same drugs we use in people. So that includes things like penicillins, tetracyclines, erythromycin, sulfa drugs. I mean, there's actually seven or eight different classes. And then the others, which are non-medically important, um, are things we don't use in human medicine. So the most important of those is called ionophores. Well, the ones we use in human medicine, we care much more about because obviously if you're using those, you're more likely to trigger resistance to form to those drugs. And then if you try to use that same drug in the human population, there's a greater chance that you've eroded how uh, effective it will be. Um, so most of what I've been talking about here today have been uh, dealing with these human uh, hu drugs of human importance. And they make up the vast majority of the antibiotics used on the farm, actually. Um, why are they being used is a good question. Uh, and it's tough to, an tough to answer, harder than it should be. By that I mean that in an ideal world, we would know exactly how many antibiotics and which antibiotics are used in farms. But neither the FDA nor the USDA wants to go on farms to find out. Um, I think they're getting a lot of pressure not to do that. And farmers don't want them, and by extension us, to know what antibiotics are being used and in what amounts. Uh, otherwise, we might do something about it. Um, so, but in general, we know from Europe and other places that antibiotics are used to treat sick animals, but that's really, really the small minority they use. The rest is used either to control diseases, in, infections in flocks or herds where just some of the animals are sick. And in general, I don't really have a problem with that as long as it's a very occasional use. But I think the vast majority of the use now is antibiotics put in animal feed or in drinking water to, in the name of preventing disease, even though the animals are healthy. So there's no vets diagnosing a condition in these animals, they're healthy. And they're using the animals basically uh, because they think it's gonna keep the animals from getting sick, even though the conditions in which they're being raised are really uh, not very good and are likely to make the animals sick. So an alternative would be to improve the conditions that you're raising the animal in, give them more vaccines, give them more space to move around in, feed them better, use better breeding, but instead they've been using antibiotics because it's sort of a quick and dirty Band-Aid and because they can. What's the difference of a pig we eat today versus a pig from say 100 years ago? Yeah, um, well, some of the things are just like chicken. We're feeding, pigs used to get slop, right? They would get anything that the farm didn't use for another purpose. And you'd throw it out in the pig sty and, and that's what they would eat. Uh, probably supplemented by some other grains and things. But now we're raising pigs in these sheds indoors. They're 
feed is very uh, carefully mixed. It's almost all corn and soybeans or other feed grains because it's got a high energy content. And um, I think one of the big differences is that pigs used to be farmed all over the country. They were pretty dispersed. Now we've concentrated the pigs so that there's a lot of pigs on one farm. So the pig farms are much bigger than they used to be. Um, I think something like 80% of the pig farms have disappeared, but the 20% that are less are vastly more larger. But the other big difference geographically is that just a few places now create a ton of pigs. So the eastern half of North Carolina, ton of pigs. Iowa, number one pig producer. Pigs in Iowa outnumber people 10 to one. Minnesota, number three, huge number of pigs where I come from. And even then, it's not like every county has pigs. They're usually concentrated in just a few places. So the pollution in those counties is enormous. There's tons of manure pollution. The streams are polluted. The air has odors and resistant bacteria and dust. So the people, the communities living around those pig farms are really impacted, even if we're not looking very hard to, to find that. When we do look, we find that people are very impacted. Is there a difference in the cows we eat today versus the cows from, say, 100 years ago? Well, 100 years ago, we still probably had cows being raised on grasslands in the middle of the country, even being driven in cattle drives to slaughterhouses. They're, out, they're raised out in the range. It was still a pretty depopulated landmass with lots of people in a few urban areas and then big parts of the middle of the country that had very few people. Um, the animals were eating some kind of grass, either hay, alfalfa if it was planted, you know, otherwise just wild grasses. And it was the Great Plains, there was plenty of grass. Uh, couldn't be farther from that today. Yes, there's a few small cattle farms that are raising cows on grass, on pasture, um, but the vast majority are in these enormous feedlots. Uh, thousands of animals big in Kansas, uh, Oklahoma, eastern Colorado. Just, um, uh, it's hard to describe unless you've seen them. I mean, they're overwhelming in their size and the dust and the, the concentration of these big animals. But what's really different is, let's think about what a cow is. A cow is a ruminant, which describes their stomach. Their stomach is designed to take cellulose in the form of grasses and break it down into what the cow needs. It's not a stomach that's designed for taking feed grains which are really different than grasses. Feed grains are high energy, a lot of calories, the pH is different. And so on these feedlots, the cattle are really eating a diet that they totally were not designed to eat. And it has an impact, it makes them sick. Um, virtually all the cattle in a feedlot develop abscesses in the liver because of the feed grains that they eat. And they know that, so one of the big reasons they use antibiotics is to keep the animal walking just long enough to get it to the slaughterhouse before they get downed by the liver abscesses. Um, so really the, the notion of raising a cow in a feedlot is part and parcel with why they're given antibiotics to such a huge degree. What's different about milk, cheese, or yogurt we drink today versus 100 years ago? So both dairies and feedlots have cattle, but there's mixtures. So for example, um, one of the ways that a modern dairy uh, operates is that it wants to keep the cows producing milk as long as possible. Well, just like humans, cows produce milk when they're pregnant and after they're pregnant, right? And so they keep impregnating the cows so that they'll, they'll keep producing milk. Well, something's got to be done with all those calves. So they sell them to feedlots and fatten them up and, sell, and get turned into beef. But anyway, for a person drinking milk or eating yogurt or ice cream, uh, 
I think it's really important to know how the modern dairy differs from the dairies of old. I live next door to Wisconsin, dairy capital of the world, or at least it used to be. Uh, in the past year, about almost 800 Wisconsin dairies have gone out of business. The, the policies are not paying those dairies enough to pay, cover their cost of production. So literally, they're better off giving away the milk than selling it to consumers. And you can't continue doing that for very long until your business starts shutting down. Uh, the uh, trade dispute that's going on hasn't helped matters. One of the ways dairy is kept in business was to sell the dried protein, dairy protein, to China and other places. Because of the trade disputes going on, that market's been really diminished now, so the dairies are going out of business. What we're left with is huge corporate dairies, um, not only in Wisconsin, but for a long time in places like the Central Valley of California. And these dairies keep getting bigger, and the um, pollution that they produce keeps getting worse. Uh, they suck up enormous amount of water so in our great wisdom we put them in places like the Central Valley of California where there's not enough water and you know it's really hot and uh, so somehow that's where we put the biggest dairies. What's the time frame for serious failure of antibiotics? That's a very good question. I would say that the time frame we don't know exactly what the time frame is but um, The fact that we've already got at least 23,000 people a year dying from antibiotics failing uh, means that we're already there uh, and it's going to get worse. The question is, how bad is it going to get? And right now, there's because we keep overusing antibiotics to such an extent, um, there's really no limit on how bad it could get before we basically stop doing many of the things that we've come to expect from modern medicine. So, hey, I've got walking pneumonia. I should get an antibiotic. Uh, used to be we could count on there being one that would work before we die or end up in the hospital. Maybe not true in five or 10 years. We do know that this uh, epidemic is getting worse quickly. So there's two categories of these last resort antibiotics, and I'll just talk about one uh, called colistin. It's a polymyxin antibiotic. It turns out that it's been hugely used in China, in pig farms, other kinds of agriculture production. They use it quite a bit in Europe, too. Well, uh, a thinking person would say, gee, if we have a last resort drug, that we only use when everything else fails, maybe not a good idea to use on farms. And yet, that's what has been going on. So a couple of years ago, um, for the first time, they found on pig farms in China a particular kind of resistance forming to colistin. Uh, it's called transmissible resistance. And what that means is that it's resistance that sits on a gene a particular kind of gene that travels very easily from one bacteria to the other. And not only that, but it's the kind of gene that can very easily get paired up with resistance to the other last resort antibiotic. So if the last step in this whole sad process is if the resistance to both those drugs end up on the same strand of DNA, and that strand of DNA travels you know, from a China to the US, then we very quickly have people dying in large numbers and there's nothing that we can do to treat them. What problems are we seeing from the overuse of antibiotics? Listen, the, this whole issue boils down to one simple equation and that is the more we use antibiotics, the quicker we're gonna hasten resistance to those drugs to develop and spread, uh, which means people are gonna start getting sicker and antibiotics are going to be less effective for things that we need them. So um, the end result of that is sicker people, more hospitalization, uh, more deaths, uh, vastly increased costs. I mean really our, our entire healthcare system is already sitting on a precipice 
where you know there's any number of things that can kind of drive the whole thing into bankruptcy, this might be the biggest one because it's so expensive to treat these infections and they're coming down the pike in such huge numbers that unless we do something drastically, I think it could torpedo the whole healthcare system. Has anyone come up with something we can do drastically yeah. to change this? Uh, th there's one very uh, good thing we can do if we had the right leadership, and that would be to set a hard target for how much f we want to reduce antibiotic use in livestock and by when. So I'll give you an example. In the Netherlands, a few years ago, I think it was 2012 or 13, they said we want to reduce antibiotic use on our farms by 50% in four years. They did it in like three years. I mean, it, it, it can, it, it's ripe for the picking. All it needs is somebody with some authority saying, we're going to do this and we're going to figure out how to do it. And in my work, I've talked a lot with veterinarians and microbiologists and doctors in Denmark and the Netherlands. And they said the big difference we see between our countries and yours is not the farms. The farms are basically the same. The difference is that in our country, we believe that we can all come together and figure a problem out and do something. And in yours, you don't. Because everybody's following the money. Right. Why are there antibiotics in our drinking water? Well, drinking water always comes from someplace upstream. So in New York City, you're getting your drinking water from upstate New York. Uh, you're lucky that the Adirondacks are somewhat protected, but there's a lot of agriculture in upstate New York. Are there antibiotics used in any of those communities? Uh, probably. Uh, it may not be affecting that watershed, but I'll tell you, I'm at the headwaters in the Mississippi, and there's enormous numbers of antibiotics going into those waters. And, you know, then they're traveling to Iowa, to St. Louis, to Memphis, to New Orleans. So, you know, virtually everybody in the U.S. is downstream of some farm, and, uh, uh, and, and in many of those farms, there's antibiotics being used and, more importantly, overused. So you're saying that it's runoff from farms and things, that that's how the antibiotics are getting into the water? Yeah, from the farm, the antibiotics go through the animal and into the manure, many of them. Where does the manure go? Well, the manure gets spread back on farmland, and then a big rainstorm comes, and it gets pollutes their waterway, and then it drifts downstream. The manure dries, and a big wind comes along and picks up the antibiotic-resistant bugs on the dust droplets and drops them in the nearest lake. Uh, in Iowa, they close down beaches on the lakes every summer because the runoff from the farms is causing too many bacteria in the water for people to safely swim. Uh, you know, there's just many, many different examples. Basically, too many animals, too little space, uh, too many drugs, and now too many problematic bacteria. So we can reverse that equation by dispersing where the animals are produced, stop using so many drugs, and take some smart steps to deal with the bacteria in a more rational matter, manner. Sorry. And by the way, you know, it's not as if farms are the only one on the hook. So are our cities. Our cities are producing enormous amounts of uh, waste, you know, manure, basically human manure. And we're dumping a lot of antibiotics into those waste streams as well. And they end up in wastewater treatment facilities, which then, uh, you know, end up coming in some, in some way back into the waterways. And we're not doing a good job of either monitoring that problem or uh, making, taking steps that would reduce the number of drugs and resistant bacteria in those facilities. Why don't we just make new antibiotics that work against whatever new strains of superbugs develop? Now, it, it would be great if our world's most complicated problems would just 
be something we could create our way out of. Um, und unfortunately, that's not the way it's going to work with climate change, and it's not the way it's going to work with antibiotic resistance. Um, the antibiotics we have, not exclusively, but by and large, are the same pipeline of antibiotics that were created over the last 60 years, and we've just been using them up. Uh, the reason that it's so, we, those were the low-hanging fruit. The reason we don't have new ones is that it's incredibly hard and expensive to find new antibiotics. It's not even clear that we can find completely new antibiotics. And the drug companies don't want to find new antibiotics. They would much rather invest their dollars in finding a new Viagra that people are going to use on an ongoing basis than an antibiotic that they're going to use for a week and then stop. So economically, the drug companies don't want to do it. I, I personally don't think the, these are common goods. We, we wouldn't want a company to make money supplying police services to the community. We also don't want a company making money trying to sell as many antibiotics to the community as they can. They're both common goods. And uh, it's problematic to think that that's where the answer is going to come to this dilemma. Why isn't this issue of antibiotic-resistant bacteria being addressed by the USDA or FDA or EPA or CDC or some other part of the United States government? There have been various, over the years, over the decades, there have been a lot of different reports that have said this is a huge issue. We need to do something. The question is who and with what leadership. So in Congress, for example, there was one microbiologist in, co in Congress, Louise Slaughter. She was a New York representative from Rochester. She was the only microbiologist. She saw this as her issue. She was incredible in bringing a law in front of the House year after year that would have actually taken some important steps forward. Oftentimes, she couldn't get a hearing from her colleagues on that law. And she certainly couldn't get the votes in the law. For many years, it was impossible to get both parties represented uh, behind the law. Only one party wanted to support the law. So for all those reasons, Congress has been a stumbling block. All right, so where else can government act? Well, the regulatory agencies. The FDA has a mandate to regulate antibiotics in livestock feed. And in the 1970s, the FDA's experts, its own scientists, said, we can't, we can't assure you, the public, that using penicillins and tetracyclines in animal feed is going to be safe for the public. And the law says that we have to take some action if we can't make that assurance. So we're going to propose this new rule in 1977 that would withdraw penicillins and tetracyclines from animal feed. So that was how many years ago? That was 42 years ago. Well, very quickly, Congress told FDA, don't do anything. We, you know, they basically said, we'll cut your budget if you dare to remove these antibiotics from animal feed. Even just two of them. Uh, why? I would imagine for political reasons, you know, somebody with money said either a pharmaceutical company or a big meat company or wh whoever, it doesn't really matter. The point is that uh, the regulatory agencies can only act if Congress allows them to act. Congress won't act for a slew of its own reasons. And so now international players are acting. The UN had every UN country in the world sign on to a declaration on antibiotic resistance. The US signed on to it, but it requires the, each individual country to set their own action plan. The US action plan is weak. We're one of the biggest meat producers in the world. So as long as we let ourselves be held hostage by a big industry like the meat industry, and they refuse to show the leadership, we're in trouble. What do you mean that some bugs are very close to being resistant? What do we do? Why isn't this a top news story? There are bacteria now that are nearly untreatable. Uh, unfortunately, the media, 
likes disasters that have already happened. They love to cover Katrina. They're not so good at covering the next Katrina that might come about or might not. And so we, you know, we find ourselves in a situation of always covering terrible, depressing, upsetting stories rather than, you know, what about the stories about the public health hero who did such a great job, nobody's ever heard of him or her. Um, we need public health heroes working in the trenches to tackle this problem, but they can't do it free. They can't do it without resources, and they can't do it without political leadership. So these, these public health servants, a lot of them are at the CDC, they're telling us, they're tracking some of the worst, most resistant strains of bacteria, the ones that are already killing people. They've told us very clearly that these are gonna get worse, more people are gonna die and get sick. Um, uh, and they would like to take action. We have plenty of reports telling us what action should be taken, um, uh, but they're just not happening. We need the government to set targets for reducing use, uh, and then there needs to be some follow through. Really, we all have a role. CEOs of meat companies have a role. If they answer to shareholders, the shareholders have a role to demand that they take action to reduce antibiotic use. You can, and some of them are figuring that out. You know, the Tysons and the Purdue's have already greatly decreased their antibiotic use. Um, the pork companies like Smithfield or Hormel, not so much. You know, cattle companies, a little trickier because there aren't like big cattle companies that everybody recognizes. They're, it's much more fragmented, so it's harder to hold any one company responsible. What is MRSA, and do you only get this from hospitals? Uh, so one of the problems with talking about the superbug crisis is that a lot of the bacteria, nobody knows what they are or can remember them. So people recognize when you, they recognize bacteria like salmonella. We know that causes food poisoning. Maybe campylobacter, which causes an equal number of food poisoning cases. Um, staph, everybody knows about staph infections. But the worst superbugs are only certain strains of those common bacteria. So for staph, the really bad one is called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA, MRSA. And uh, right now, it used to just be a problem in hospitals, but for many years now, it's been cropping up in communities as well. By communities, I mean that just your average person, your average teenager or healthy adult is suddenly getting MRSA and ending up near death in the hospital because it's either difficult to treat, so they get very sick by the time they figure that out, or uh, you know, close to impossible to treat. That's why we have more than 19,000 deaths a year from MRSA, and it's athletes, it's it's, you know, it's football players and cheerleaders and, you know, perfectly healthy 20-year-olds who are just up and dying or getting maimed or disabled. Terrible, terrible infection. What can we do to stop a future where antibiotics don't work? Uh, well... The main thing is to stop using antibiotics when we really don't need them to work today. Uh, and we probably also could be investing in some other things that help us avoid using antibiotics. So for example, um, if we know there's a source of infection somewhere, let's figure out what else we can do to clean that environment, you know, to keep it cleaner. We're never going to, it's not like a battle. Everyone wants to use a battle member for, metaphor where, where bacteria are the, are the enemy and our job is to fight the bacteria. First of all, that's wrong. Bacteria, we need bacteria. What we don't want is resistant bacteria. So the, the battle mem metaphor has really served us poorly because everybody's reaction has been to flood their households with antibacterial soaps. Well, guess what? You use an antibacterial soap, 
and you're breeding antibiotic resistant bacteria. <laughs> if you take antibiotics when you don't need them, you're bringing about more antibiotic resistant bacteria. So the key is not to fight bacteria as if they're the enemy. The key is to treasure antibiotics as if they're an incredibly miraculous tool and use them very, very, very sparingly and to make sure drug companies use them very, very, very sparingly as well. Not so good for a shareholder model though, is it? So that's, that's one of the most challenging things is to figure out how do we try and invent new antibiotics and then uh, you know, if it's a company creating them, we have to convince the company that, yes, we want you to create this antibiotic, but we don't actually want you to sell a lot of it. <laughs> How do bacteria actually become resistant to antibiotics? Yeah, that, it's a very complicated, in-depth explanation, but it doesn't have to be. It really boils back to Darwin and evolution. So bacteria are one of the places we see evolution play out the quickest. And basically evolution says, if you put it, whether it's a human being or a bacteria, you put it in a challenging environment and you're gonna select for the bacteria or the person who's the best equipped to fight that challenge. Well, when we put antibiotics into an environment, we're stressing the bacteria and the bacteria that are gonna win out that are gonna outcompete their neighboring bacteria are the ones that are resistant. Now some resistance already lives around us in bacteria. They always have. The difference is that we've now flooded our environments with antibiotics and so we keep selecting more and more for those resistant bacteria. And whereas before they might have been resistant to one drug, maybe they were just resistant to penicillin, now more and more there's these superbugs that are resistant to 12, even more antibiotics, and they're all connected, and they're passing that resistance on to other, other bacteria, making them resistant too. The reason bacteria become resistant is that they acquire the genes that make them resistant. The big question is why do they want to get those genes? Because it, it costs them something to get resistance genes. There has to be a good compelling need for them and we provide that need by flooding our environment with antibiotics. If we take away that flood of antibiotics or even reduce it, we make it so that bacteria will not uh, find an evolutionary advantage to seek out those genes. What is the link between the meat industry and antibiotic resistant bacteria? You know, a lot of people, when I talk about this issue, uh, think that I'm maligning meat producers, and I'm really not. I think that in many cases, meat producers, I'll, I'll use pork producers as an example, they are in a really difficult place. So we've allowed companies to drive small pork producers out of business and make other producers keep getting bigger. and. In the hog industry, there are big companies that they don't actually grow the pigs. Um, they own the pigs and they own the pork, but they don't own the farms or the pollution. So they have contracts with what they call contact growers. And those growers get a big loan and they build a hog barn. And the meat company brings them the piglets and they bring them the feed and they bring them the, the feed as antibiotics into it. It's pre-mixed in many cases. And they give all that to the farmer and they say, um, we want you to raise these pigs to slaughter weight, but we don't want any of the risk. You have all the risk. So if your manure lagoon breaks, the risk is on you. If you get a big outbreak, the risk is on you. If the government decides that you shouldn't be using antibiotics and your barn's too contaminated, uh, and it's making your pig sick, the risk is on you. The only thing we care about is your meat. So you have all the risk, we get all the profit. And that's the way the business is structured. So now we've got an epidemic of resistance. And so we basically know that the industry is broken. It's concentrated all this production of pigs in very small areas with a lot of antibiotics because there's a lot of disease in these facilities. 
Well, we could build better facilities, but that would mean making the farmer assume even more debt to build a new facility, and they haven't finished paying off the old facility. So what are we going to do? Um, I think the farmers, in some cases, feel like they, they have to just dig in their heels and say, no, this is the way we do it, this is the way we want to keep doing it. And, you know, in the medical profession, on the other side, we're saying, but if you keep doing it that way, we may not have antibiotics for very much longer. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of where we're stuck. I will tell you that in the countries where they've made the biggest gains at reducing antibiotic use in, in farms, on farms, it's where there's been a partnership between the government and the meat industry and there's been some sharing of resources, there's been some help provided, and they have like a common goal, and we don't have that. What would happen if you remove the antibiotics from these pig farms? Right, well, it's interesting, because the, the claim by the pig industry has been that they need antibiotics to keep their animals healthy, but in fact, their animals keep getting sicker and sicker. Um, and that's from surveys that the USDA actually does. They, they ask a certain number of hog farmers, like, have you had more problems with this and this? And over the last several years, they have more and more problems. They say that antibiotics are the key to keep the animals healthy. We've been using a ton of antibiotics and the animals are less and less healthy. So something's got to give. I think the problem is that what really has to give is a whole new approach to keeping animals healthy. More vaccines, uh, better nutrition, uh, better breeding, giving the animals more space, probably moving some of these farms so they're not all so close together because that also makes more animals sick. You know, when they pass around diseases from farm to farm and it's super easy because they're just down the road from one another. Um, but all those other things that aren't antibiotics take two things, knowledge and resources. Well, we've got the knowledge, um, but we don't, the farmer doesn't often have the knowledge. It used to be that the universities had extension agents and they would go out to the farms and say, hey, we've got this new problem we want to tell you about. Well, um, as the number of farms has declined, those extension agents have disappeared. The universities didn't want to support them anymore. The taxpayers didn't want to support them anymore. So there's nobody other than the drug companies and the meat companies providing knowledge to the farmers. And those two entities are telling the farmers, hey, what you're doing is great. Keep doing it. Can animals be raised without antibiotics? Of course animals can be raised without antibiotics. They, they always have been. You know, before there were antibiotics, did we raise animals? Yes. Did we enjoy meat? Yes, how did we do it? The same way we always did it before antibiotics. We did everything we could to keep the animals healthy. Uh, sometimes they got an infection. There were certain things we could do to prevent infections. We did those things. Uh, the problem has been with abundant cheap antibiotics. And keep in mind that in 23 states, if you buy antibiotics to put in your pig feed, you don't have to pay taxes on it. There's an exemption from the sales tax. So there are little laws like that that actually incentivize people to use more antibiotics. So anyway, um, so antibiotics are cheap, too cheap, uh, at least for that purpose, and they're abundant, and so we've used them instead of investing in other things. Where's the research into stronger, more resilient breeds? Where's the research into um, uh, better animal feeds? Where's the research into uh, vaccines? You know, one of the problems is in human medicine, if you don't want people to get some bacterial infection, maybe you can have a vaccine for it. But the pharmaceutical companies see a good market, and so they're more likely to invent that vaccine. The market is much smaller in, on farms, and so we don't have a compelling incentive for companies to create farm vaccines. Um, so I think we could do a lot more on that score. Again, leadership is lacking. I think a lot of these things could be done if only there was more leadership. And you know, compared to the trillions that we're gonna spend trying to reverse this epidemic, it would be money well spent. If there's antibiotic-resistant bacteria in meat we're buying, 
then why aren't even more people getting sick and dying from antibiotic-resistant bacteria? Yeah. So one of the things that I try to explain to people about the environment and health is that we're not all the same person. Some of us have naturally better immunity. Um, so you might get exposure to one bacteria and in you it causes a really bad disease. In me, nothing happens. How do we explain that? Well, how do we explain that you might get lung cancer and I don't, even though I smoke 30 pack years? You know, people are just people, they're different. Uh, and it's the same with these resistant bugs. Um, also, just because there's bugs in the meat, you might cook your food better, you might prepare it better, you might be more sanitary in the kitchen. You know, there's all sorts of other factors involved. Um, I think one can get tied up trying to look for explanations about why that person gets sick and this one doesn't. And it really distracts us from the bigger issue. Is resistance getting worse? Yes. Do we, knew what, do we know what's driving it? Yes. Antibiotic use and overuse. So rather than tie our, ourselves in knots trying to answer all these questions, it would be great if we could all just agree on tackling the one thing we can all agree on, that antibiotic overuse is driving the problem. Because we know how to do that. Thank you.